welcome the first panelist. They are um, Joanne Murphy, Managing Director of Asia Pacific CAIA Association, and Plans Theme CEO of China, SMP Global, and Canon Castle Forder, the registered foreign lawyer. Baker and Mackenzie, and also Stephen Davidson, the Managing Director, Head of China Strategy and Chief of Staff, J.P. Morgan. Welcome. Um, thank you and uh, welcome back from lunch everybody. A uh, pleasure always to be here in China, and particularly here in Beijing today. I think um, for anyone that's here from Hong Kong, the Typhoon T8 has been raised. So um, we're happy to be here in the glorious weather in Beijing on a Wednesday afternoon. Um, firstly, I do wish to say thank you to Barrow Consulting and all the, the group involved. I've, I've learned a great deal the last couple of days just listening and absorbing what's being discussed here. So sincerely bravo um, to all at Barrow Consulting and the others. I work for the Kaira Association. We do two things. We have a professional qualification in alternative investments and a professional qualification in all things around financial data processing. So the format of the, of the actual conference could not be better. Um, I think we're at a very interesting point in markets and a very interesting point in time. So our, our discussion is going to be about global financial firms entering China's capital markets, which is a huge topic, but very, very delighted to have three learned professionals to my left who are going to touch on quite a broad range of topics in our allotted half an hour this afternoon. I think maybe to kick things off, we'll get the viewpoint from the lawyer of our group here, Kenan, before we have some thoughts being shared from Stephen, who was actually on a panel from JP Morgan this morning, and then Clemens, who heads up the S&P group here in China as well. But maybe I'll kick off with Kenan and ask him to pick up on some of the points we heard from this morning. And walk us through where are we in the regulatory regime for all things relating to foreign capital coming in and capital coming out of the, the China landscape. Absolutely. The landscape for foreign investors looking to break into the Chinese equity markets, the Chinese fixed income markets, has actually been a relatively dynamic element. And for a lawyer, that means a lot of analysis, research, and a, a bit more billable, so that does help us out. Um, but it's been a long course. We've seen a lot of twists and turns, whether that's the launch of QV in 2002 or the introduction of RQV in 2011. We then stepped it up with the introduction of the Connects. So we had the Shanghai uh, Hong Kong Stock Connect launched in 2014 and its Shenzhen equivalent in 2016. We've then seen the introduction of the CIBM Direct Access as well as the Bond Connect. Um, so we've really seen dynamic and new and innovative ways in which the Chinese regulators have begun opening up these markets to foreign investors. We have seen their willingness to move away from um, some of the, the, the more restrictive elements, which are the, the lockups for repatriation that, that previously existed in RQV and QV, um, because as we've seen, a lot of the changes that have come about, and the reason a lot of these were launched, is really to deal with the, the regulatory concerns that Chinese regulators have for the management of foreign uh, for currency outflows and being able to maintain the stability and integrity of their own markets. From the perspective of what foreign investors are really looking at now is they now have a, a relative cornucopia of options. And so what we'll get questions on from the foreign investor standpoint is really what are the benefits and what are the options that I have and how do I take advantage of those. So if you're an investor who's looking to establish directly in China, then your QV and RQV process might be the way to go. You might be looking to say that I want to be able to invest directly and have access to a much broader scope of investment options, since the QV and RQV do provide you access to both the equity and the bond market. Or you might say that I want to take a step back and be able to do some more indirect access and exposure through some of the stock connects and be able to utilize the, the, the structures that exist in Hong Kong to not necessarily have to have the same level or intensity of infrastructure that's required with having the QV and RQV licenses, whether that's applying for the quota, dealing directly with the regulators, or directly engaging the onshore custodians. You may decide that going with the, the, the light touch, which is the stock connect, might be the way to go. 
or and what we're seeing more and more is that managers are saying I want to take advantage of a wide range of them so my portfolio is really going to encompass um, the various access programs so I might have both an RQV license but may still trade on um, the, the stock connect and from that we've seen managers making very interesting and very new um, choices in how they want to structure their access programs to be able to take advantage of the various routes that they now have at their hands. Wow, it's an interesting landscape out there and I think getting a feel for where we are is important so, so thank you Kenan for that. Um, I think Stephen, you've obviously been through the good, the bad and the ugly of the different regulatory controls and structures and, and built a business um, looking at that particular path to navigate. Can you talk a little bit about how JP Morgan got to be here as a foreign organisation and how you've actually built that business here on the ground? Yeah, so maybe just touching to, to finish on, on the point that Ken raised around the global investors and access and, and you know, in terms of what do we actually see, uh, you know, when you look at the statistics of foreign participation, the numbers are still relatively low in China, I think there's 2 percent across equity and fixed income markets, relative to other markets. Uh, and as we've seen access schemes open up, as we've seen in parallel with in increased inclusion, we're starting to see growth in the flow, the stock connect being one example, and bond connect starting to, to see some movement. Um, the reality is, is that there, there is a lot of people are still on the sidelines, a huge amount of people that are ready, that have started to set up, have got their accounts set up, or maybe put test trades through, uh, and who are waiting for that right moment and that right trigger point. And, the question is, what's going to be the catalyst to drive the sort of three, four hundred, you know, billion worth of flow inflows that are inevitable? I mean, we do think they will be inevitable because as the inclusion grows, foreign firms will just have to start, particularly, um, you know, passive indexes to track index global indexes will just have to start buying um, and acquiring themselves. So that flow is coming. We think it's inevitable, um, and it really is just waiting for that trigger. And I think it's at certain points. In the inclusion process, the, the amount, you know, the, the percentage of inclusion gets to a level that you just have to start to hold direct. You cannot hedge proxy or, you know, or you know using offshore stocks, etc. So I, we think that's close, uh, and we see, you know, that's that's supported by the amount of foreign firms that are getting ready and setting up and asking us and talking to us. And obviously, we're a very large global custodian, so a lot of those big funds talk to us. Um, but it hasn't quite translated, I would say, into a, a massive spike in foreign participation in the market yet. But it does feel like we're on the, on the, the verge of something um, very soon. And uh, uh, how, how soon? I, I think there's, on, on the stock market, I think it'll be progressive with each inclusion, each increase in percentage of inclusion, which is happening. I think uh, we had someone from, from MCI here, I think it's every six months, but there's regular growth and in inclusion. Um, bond indexes, we've already seen uh, inclusion in the Russell and, in, uh, and the Bloomberg uh, Barclays index. The big one is, is the Jane Morgan one, which I think is, is something that's, that's under some review. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised, um, you know, if, if there's more movement on that this, this side of uh, this year or into next year. So that will trigger, I would say, within the next six, six to 12 months minimum, um, the growth that, you know, that is, it is kind of inevitable on this. Um, and then just to turn to your second question around setting up a business, uh, look, I think we, we've been reasonably public about the fact that we are um, if, if, you know, investing at scale in, in China. Uh, it's not that we haven't been in the past. We've been here through legacy companies for over 100, nearly 100 years now. It's our 100th anniversary in, in 2021. Um, but like many foreign firms in the last 10, 15 years, have probably been sitting on the sidelines a bit and, and waiting, really waiting for a couple of things. Um, first is, market reform and increased access. Um, you know, obviously, as a global firm, our clients are global. We go where they go. If they're coming into a market, then we need to be there to support them. Um, so that's a big driver, is the reform of the market and hence global participation, and then that triggers us to be there to support our clients. Uh, I think the other more obvious um, trigger point for us at the moment is around um, foreign ownership. Uh, I think it's just the ability to have a line of sight to full ownership is a significant, very significant for most foreign firms. Just just the ability it gives you to then set a company up to your own controls, standards, uh, the way you want to, and also to, to have the discretion to manage the strategy um, yourself as opposed to have to manage a joint strategy across uh, shareholders is, is, is one that's, that's very, very important for, for firms. Uh, you know, until, until you have that, there's always a concern around risk profile and do you really understand the market and how much risk you're taking. Um, but having said all that, uh, you know, 
that, that we're in the midst of setting up our securities company, as, as many many people know from, from the press. Um, we already have a bank here. Um, the reality is, is that it is a very challenging process. And setting up any emerging market is a very challenging process. Uh, it, it takes a lot of patience, a lot of time, significant amount of investment. Um, and the challenges are not just external in the, in, the, in the location. Some of the biggest challenges are internal within your organization in terms of education, explaining to people, getting them comfortable, getting to understand the market, getting to understand dynamics, how to operate in a local way, the behavior. Um, so the internal story is a, is, is a difficult one for most farm firms, um, particularly you know, if you're headquartered in, in, you know, in the US, etc. cetera. Um, and then you throw into that the challenges of hiring is very, very difficult in this market. The fact that you may need to set up an entirely set of infrastructure, data centers, offices, um, then you've got to get regulatory approval on licenses, um, you know, and, and all of that in a market that you, even if you've, you're familiar with, you don't really know. Um, and then you throw into that some of the, you know, the other challenges that are happening uh, geopolitically at the moment, as well as a very fast-paced moving regulatory environment. Um, it, it's difficult, There's, there is a lot of speed bumps, um, and you need a lot of patience, a lot of understanding, and it's not something you can do without significant investment or bringing your best global talent to the table. You need to bring the best global talent to set this kind of business up, given the complexity of the market. So it sounds like it's been an interesting path thus far for, for JP Morgan. And um, I think, obviously, bringing Clemens now into the conversation, you know, from S&P's perspective, they've had a, a phenomenally interesting year, particularly here in China. You've just been granted the very first foreign license here domestically. Can you maybe contrast some of the points Stephen touched on by way of staff, operations, establishment, building a business here, and how S&P have gone about that? Yeah, I think for, for us it's a, really um, a journey. I think S&P Global in China is largely known as a provider of cross-border information. So be that the ratings, international ratings uh, that local investors and pension funds invest, be that indices, the, the market intelligence data on global M&A and investment opportunities of Platts, which is a global provider of commodities prices. So for us, it's really a change in, in paradigm to now actually setting up a domestic business, a domestic rating agency. And S&P was the first international rating agency that got the license to um, actually fully own a domestic rating agency. And we're pleased to just announce that uh, we had our second rating out yesterday. The first one was out three weeks ago. And uh, clearly now the expectations are that that grows pretty quickly. And who did you rate yesterday? Sorry? Who did you rate yesterday? Uh, Lujo Bank, which is a um, Sichuan-based regional Good. bank. Good, What's the? Um, so it's a triple B rating. Okay. <laughs> um, so for us, I, the question we get is why, why you know, what, why do we do this? Uh, I think it's all it's all related to uh, to market needs. Um, so on the one hand, we did uh, make a significant commitment to hire analysts before we had the license to localize our methodologies. Um, really show commitment that we have a local scale that really measures relatively the credit quality in China versus what the global scale does, which measures the global comparability. Um, but then also. Um, I think the market need that we saw, there is a, a need for more granularity in ratings. Um, when we look at the, the AAA range in China, there's a spread of around 400 basis points. Um, so international investors are used to that spread being, being, being a lot lower, and, and by being able to provide more, more granular ratings, um, you're able to do that. Then I think there's an information gap. Um, for local investors, but particularly for international investors, and if you look at if you look at Bond Connect, um, look at the opportunity that international investors have, and I think today it's only about 2% of the Chinese bond markets are invested by international investors. I think there's a need to really provide transparency to the international community, and that's where S&P Global thinks we, we have an important role to play. Now, you know, I think just the sheer flows that we're seeing around the world that wish to find and navigate their path into China, We've got venture capital investments, we've got infrastructure investments, we've got cash that wants to be put into hedge funds, not least the traditional world as well. I think, Stephen, you touched on some points before insofar as the capital flows and building a business to be ready to accept that capital as it comes into China. 
I think we heard from MSCI a little bit earlier this, this morning as well on its percentage weight in the MSCI World Index as well will be changing. So more capital will be flowing into China over the months and the years ahead. And maybe we'll go back to Kenan and talk about some of the change that's required to open up the landscape. We've got a few ways of gaining access to China today, um, QFII, etc. What's next on those new access points? And then we can contrast and how that's going to affect the business points thereafter. But from a legal perspective and from a regulatory perspective, we heard a little bit about that before lunch, but regulatory-wise, what are we seeing? What's going to happen? As you mentioned, with the introduction of MCI, and as that builds up, that's going to impact the current structures because we're going to see a lot more flow in uh, money to be able to keep up with that. So you're going to have passive investors who are trying to do so. And so for some of the access programs like the Stock Connect systems, which do have daily quota for the general market, as that quota is consumed by new investors or investors who are now entering the system for um, in response to the MSCI index and its increased I mean, the last time we had a rebalancing, we saw a significant increase in trading um, on the stock connect. And so for um, other investors who've been utilizing that as their primary system, they are just another one of the, the members of the, of the trading public when it comes to using up that quota. So to the extent that QP and RQP have remained um, underutilized to some extent, we, we see that it might actually become more in favor because having your own individual quota might be the way to offset some of that execution risk that's going to exist if the daily quota that exists for the stock connect systems are going to be consumed more and more by investors who necessarily weren't there before, but because of the changes with the introduction of the MSCI index, um, might become a, a, a more active and more frequent player. Um, we've seen the regulators making pushes to kind of revamp the QP and RQP systems. Um, earlier this year, we saw them make a proposal um, uh, to be able to merge or consolidate the two and really make those two access programs more uh, favorable and potentially court new investors to want to seek those programs. The, and that includes streamlining the process for getting the, the registration, licensing, and the quota, um, actually making it look a, a lot more like what they've done with Bond Connect. And they're, they're, the proposal is also looking to open up the type of investments that you would be able to do through those access programs, which is huge for alternative investments, because that opens the world to futures and other derivatives-related options, which we didn't have before. And so you're going to be able to run a more comprehensive portfolio, particularly from a hedging perspective, if you're able to utilize those type of instruments on shore. And so we've seen them try to revamp their the access programs because obviously um, over time they streamlined some of the processes. Some of the same considerations aren't necessarily salient. And so I think one thing that our clients and investment managers would like to see is, yes, you have all these options right now, but you have to learn what each one is. You have to learn how each one operates. And so to the, to, to the extent that we can provide more continuity and kind of bring them together so that there's more harmonization, that would make it easier for investment managers. And we've seen with the proposal that they're starting to do that. They're starting to recognize that they want them to seem more similar in terms of the processes, the operational barriers to getting involved. And I think that investment managers will be able to do so. Um, one of the new events this year was the London Shanghai Stock Connect, and so we've seen even even outside of the Hong Kong context, the fact that that was opened up, the fact that we do have global depository receipts that are going back and forth, is really starting to open up Shanghai and the mainland to um, significant other financial markets. And mainland investor, Chinese investors, are going to have opportunities to be directly engaging with other major financial hubs around the world. So this is probably just the start to seeing what other financial hubs, but it's a significant step to bring an EU time zone into the realm for Chinese investors to be able to, to bolster their portfolio and diversify their portfolio. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. It's now but not a case of if, it's a case of when. And that timing is going to have some massive implications as to where the flows go and how businesses will grow. 
Stephen, what are your thoughts on that? I don't often ask the same question, but I think the fact we have three different voices here, it is important to see from J.P. Morgan's perspective and your own thought process, what do you think is going to happen from the regulatory framework? Look, I think we view all of the reform that's, that's happening and happening in an accelerated now very positively and constructively. Um, you know, the trigger for us to, to expand more was, was, goes beyond the, you know, the ownership component to a real fundamental belief uh, and the, the market is, is really opening up here and opening up at a very accelerated pace and that this is a longer term commitment that's in the interests of, of, of China. Um, so, you know, we talk about foreign ownership, but, you know, we talk about the, the reform of the, the QF programs to allow increased access, bond connect, etc. But then, you know, you, you, there's just, you know, even two weekends ago, the PBOC with its 11 new measures, there's, there's some fantastic stuff in there around, you know, bond underwriting and capabilities, um, around simplification of, of bond connect and, and improving the operational flow. Um, there's a continuous uh, flow of reform in the asset wealth management space, which, um, you know, you can see the excitement and interest from so many in the asset wealth management space and the, the push to come on shore now is, is, is very strong in that space because of the, the pace of reform and, you know, it will normalise the market such that it will start to look and feel and operate a little bit more like what a lot of the foreign firms are used to and hence that's where the firms will feel we have expertise here that's, that's helpful and that we feel will help the development of the local market. So um, all that reform is, is, is definitely very positive. If you look at what's happening with um, the Star Board, um, the Science Technology Board, and the you know introduction of more uh, in the capital markets and capital raising a regime that's more similar to what we have in other other foreign uh, capital markets, and you know we, we would assume that that's if successful as a pilot that may find its way into the A shares. Again, extremely positive um, move and one that the, you know will, will where foreign firms can have bring knowledge, expertise, and experience and can help that. Um, uh, the the uh, sort of Shanghai London Connect scheme and the listing of GDRs in in, uh, in in London enabling Chinese companies to raise capital offshore and for, you know to support CDRs and homecoming of, of Chinese companies and for other foreign companies to list in China and raise capital here. I think they're all you know very constructive and positive uh, and all show the strength of the commitment from China to really open up and and, and this is why I think a lot of foreign firms have a higher conviction now because they see that. Um, they see the pace of it, the, how, how much it's accelerated, and they see the continual flow of it, and um, you know, that, that just drives the investment story for many foreign firms. No, for sure, and I think it is a high conviction, Steve, that we're seeing consistently. If you pick up any newspaper article about institutional investor flows and appetite to be more involved in China, you're seeing much more about that familiarity. The grounds are very similar. And I think as these regimes come forward, that, that what we talked about by both Ken and Stephen, we're going to see more of that. It's different for, for S&P though, Ken, and so what do you need in order to, to progress? You know, you've got that first license to do things, you've got your second rating out. What do you need to, to operate on moving forward here in China? What has to change for you? Yeah, I think uh, just to echo Stephen's comments around the uh the observations we made with uh, the regulatory framework, I think it's a uh, regulators have taken a very thoughtful approach in opening the market. It's, it's, it's long term, and no doubt um, there'll be there'll be additional steps taken. So we're we're asking ourselves as a provider of insights and benchmarks, how can we actually help the international community and the domestic community to take advantage of these opportunities? So if Bank Connect. Um, is available to so many more international investors. Like, how, how can we get the right information into the right hands to make the right decisions? Uh, so I think for us, the question is really, how do we need to modify how we operate in China? And I think the, the principle we have is around sort of leveraging our strengths, uh, but then adapt it and tweak it to the local market. And to give you an example of, of the market intelligence business, um, it benefits in China and outside China from the S&P brand. Uh, looks at the quality of data. Uh, in fact, there is a, a, a commitment to clients if they find an error in um, our fundamental data sets, we'll pay them $50. Okay. So we're, we're bringing that commitment to China. Um, clearly, on all data sets that we have in China, we cannot have that commitment. However, uh, we're able to make the commitment on the same data set, fundamental of listed companies in China to global investors. 
Um, and the feedback we're getting is that that creates a lot of confidence in them, into, into the quality that we have. In China, it actually helps them also save costs on quality control. Uh, so I think it's really, it's really one, one benefit that we can bring to the market. Do we have challenges? Oh yeah. Um, I think like localizing our platform in a way that it's uh, easily accessible to, to Chinese um, clients, like all of our content and technology is currently hosted outside the country. So bring that to the country, um, making the user experience as smooth um, as it is elsewhere. Um, and then also just simple things like how we do business in China. Um, so our contracting and invoicing is all like done out of the US. So those that are locally here will understand like getting a US dollar invoice from, from New York and then getting a follow-up call uh, when the money doesn't arrive. So there's a lot of things we need to do. Uh, but I think yeah. really... But those challenges provide opportunities. It's a, it's, so. Exactly. It's, it's a journey for us. We're, we're uh, relatively new to the, to, the, to the local markets, but we, we also see it um, as a, as a long-term long -term commitment. And also it's a learning ground, I think, for so many foreign businesses wanting to take advantage of the partnership opportunities and, and the opportunities domestically. It's a learning territory to go through that stage of understanding and evaluating side by side to keeping current with the regulatory regime and the framework and how you can navigate through. So there's no doubt there's some phenomenal opportunities here that it's going to take time for that all to trickle through the system. I'm mindful we've got a few minutes left, but I'd always um, like to open up to, to invite participation from our audience. Are there any questions or any thoughts that anybody would like to raise to our panelists this afternoon? Who's feeling brave? Okay. No? Well, there is one thing that I had hoped to... Oh, yes, please, sir. I think you've just exposed one of our challenges here. Uh, apologies. <laughs> uh, so you just uh, talk about the stock market. Uh, but my question is, uh, how, how, uh, how to enter the market while uh, uh, stock here? The private company, not not uh, own stock company. He just mentioned if you're representing a PE or VC, so do you have any channels to enter the Chinese stock market? For the private equity and the venture capital, um, I, I mean a lot of those will be will be addressing through through different mechanisms like the programs like the rookie programs and being able to, to enter into joint ventures uh, oftentimes will be the, the avenue um, but they'll be able to utilize um, the, the investments through QB and RQ fee to be able to access direct equity markets um, but in, in terms of the actual um, investments into companies um, oftentimes we'll see joint ventures or, or other more traditional fees. And I think the Woofy is a very well-established structure that, that a lot of foreign investors are comfortable with. So if you are a private equity business here seeking capital to come your way, a Woofy would be a, a structure that you'd use to do that, or some form of a joint venture, um, whether it be a, a profit share or some form of a facility where that investment can flow from the foreign investment into the local investment. I appreciate your question. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think we'll see an increase in the number of the EVC fund setting up domestically using the PFM or Wolfie structure in order to have onshore access, uh, to onshore direct access to you know unlisted private private stocks. Um, it's quite difficult, but I think that's, there's there's no doubt there will be um, significant growth in that area as as investors, offshore investors, start to understand the market, understand the licensing, understand how much, what they need to invest here, capital, and what they can do once they're set up, um, but even to get a PFM license is not trivial. You know, there's, there's a, a certain amount of investment you need to make to set up a, a private fund domestically. Yeah, I think the barriers to entry are quite significant at the moment from a size perspective, but you can do it, for sure. Thank you. 
Um, one question I did have that I was hoping to have heard a little bit more on over the last couple of days is just the, the, the current trade situation between America and here in China. I'm not raising that to be in any way um, sensationalistic or, or, or raising any challenges, but I know Stephen, it's something you feel comfortable to talk about is to give us some viewpoints on where we are on that particular agenda. I mean, look, obviously it's an act of dialogue. Um, from, a, from an organisation perspective, clearly, you know, anything that creates uh, uncertainty in the market is not good for our clients, and if it's not good for our clients, it's not good for, for us as a financial institution supporting those clients. So the uncertainty that comes from from these these types of disputes and the uncertainty in supply chain and, you know, for local corporates having to look for new markets, sources of markets, having to move supply chain from multinational corporations concerned and, and reducing foreign investment. Um, it all has creates instability, people you know, not raising capital because of the instability in the market. That uncertainty doesn't help our clients and clearly doesn't help you know financial institutions that are supporting them. So clearly it's not in the interests of, of you know from the market stability perspective. Um, but then on you know by the flip side certainly um, there's been a, a significant amount of reform on the financial services side that, that is has has happened in parallel with some of the situation, which I think, from a foreign firm perspective, has has been positive. So, so the, the, there's upside and downside in the situation, and um, you know, but I think everyone's uh, you know, everyone's interest is, is that hopefully this gets we move beyond this at some point soon because it's not good for the global economy, and it's, it's not good for our clients, it's not good for most financial institutions. Let's hope that change will happen quickly. Now, just in the interest of time, we have a couple of minutes, and I always think from a panel perspective... Oh, sorry, yes, please, sir. Do we have a microphone, please? Thank you. So, I have a one question. may not be uh, quite related, but uh, for Stephen, uh, because you know they came from uh, JP Morgan. Uh, so recently, there's a new um, there's a new announcement. There's an announcement that allows the uh, the Chinese Commercial Bank to set up the uh, sort of wealth management subsidiary. Um, so we know that it's actually many banks already uh, got the license, and, but also the new announcement is really allow them to have the JV with the foreign uh, partners, right? Either banks or wealth management or asset management companies. So. How do you comment on that? Do you know that as a, you know, what sort of interest you see from the overseas, you know, joining at this kind of JV? Yeah, I think the, you know, obviously all the big four, the big five, uh, have got a prior, applied for the Bank Wealth Management subsidiary license, um, and that's in an attempt to push out of the banks the, you know, implicit guarantee wealth management products and push them into, you know, to segregate the engineering of wealth management products from the core banking business um, and to push that into the subsidiaries. And obviously the banks um, uh, are quickly working out that to do that they need expertise in wealth management and asset management and, and not many of them have that relative to say the securities side of the fence or the fund management side of the, of the fence, mutual fund management side. Um, so clearly they need and are looking for partners to work with to help them grow and develop and learn that business um, because it's not a, a business that the banks have traditionally been doing. Um, the question is then really around what, is, what would be the angle from a foreign player um, and I suppose it kind of depends on the foreign players and what interests they have. Um, for example, JP Morgan has a 49% interest in an existing asset management company, um, CIFM, China International Funds Management Limited. You can see from the press that we're, we're, we're looking to increase our ownership. Um, so, you know, the question really is, is, is you know, how, does, how complementary would that be if you already have an asset manager? Um, for companies that don't have an existing asset manager, um, clearly there's definitely uh, an angle there. Um, the, but it, it sort of depends on, for those big five, would those vehicles be, um, would they give away majority ownership or not, or would they only allow a, you know, an investor of you know, 20%, 49%? Um, so what would be the path for those entities? Are you just an equity investor, or would you get a path to control of those? And, and I think that's for the market to really, really work out. Um, the other question really is, what does it allow you to do in terms of your cap their capabilities? Clearly you can distribute funds, you can manufacture funds. Um, but when you look at a, a, a global vision of what an asset, a wealth manager is, not asset manager, but a wealth manager, like a private bank, and you look at the collection of services that a foreign private bank would, would have in its, in its, in its product offering, um, to put that together in China, you need a multiple of entities and licenses. 
the bank subsidiary doesn't give you all the components. You need a bit of be able to take deposits and do structured deposits, you need to be able to do structured products, you need to be able to do brokerage, you need to do the margin lending, um, you need to be able to a variety of services, private funds, and, and, and putting all that together it requires a bit of a collection of things that may not necessarily be, that you don't get with one license. Um, so I think that will probably be a factor when um, wealth management, foreign wealth managers are looking at this in terms of um, how would I put that together. Um, but look, it's a very, it's a positive development. Um, and I think we'll definitely see some a lot of global interest in in, in those in, in investing and, and partnering in those types of arrangements. Um, but it will depend on the individual company and what their current setup is in China. Do they have Wolfie? Do they have PFM? Do they have are they going to go from PFM to you know, fund you know mutual fund license? Do they have an existing joint venture with an existing asset management company? Um, does that company have its own you know private fund management company that it, it, it owns? There's a variety of factors depending on what your current setup is that will determine whether that's the right uh, model. Great, thank you Stephen. I'm very respectful that we are at the end of our panel, but I do want to just, if I may, invoke from, from Vinay, just 30 seconds to each, just pass some final thoughts. So you know, it's a huge topic we've been asked to address this afternoon, foreign appetite coming into China and businesses operating here. Maybe you could just take 30 seconds to sum up your thoughts on that please, Clemens. I, I think it's a, uh, as we've all, much found that a very dynamic market. Um, I think it's very interesting on this panel here and throughout this couple of days to compare notes on what our thinking is and where we are. I'd actually be very curious where we are in a year's time. It might be quite different. Let's see. Um, can I? I think the fast paced regulatory updates and changes that are occurring make it something that foreign investors are going to have to continuously be evaluating and reassessing their portfolio and their portfolio composition and the ways in which they're looking to actually invest in and approach the Chinese market. Um, with, with the trade war, it, it's clearly a period of disruption for the global economy, but um, it can be an inflection point where there changes the opportunity cost for investment managers, how they want to allocate capital, where they want to be able to invest, what is now um, going to be the, the best way for them to utilize their skill set and their capital to be able to approach different markets. And so. I think that it's a, it's a time when investment managers will have the most opportunity to kind of step back and, and evaluate exactly how they want their long-term investment to look. Super, thank you. And Stephen, 30 seconds. I think we, we, we remain <laughs> bullish, um, and uh, but we understand that this is not a short-term, it's a long-term commitment investment, and you know we, we will take a long-term view. We you know we we, we have a, a strong belief that the existing um, reform measures will continue and continue at this pace and, and that, that there will be a growth in, in foreign participation in the market and, and we hope we can bring and contribute to the development because we do think it, it's generally it's in, in China's interest um, in terms of uh, overall. So we're very committed to, to being part of that and supporting the, the endeavours. Super, thank you Stephen. I think um, we've had a, a great session this afternoon. I really thank Stephen, indeed I thank, I thank Clement and I thank, I thank Kenan as well. I'm actually with Clem and I think it'll be interesting to see where we are in 12 months' time. Global appetite is going nowhere. This domestic market has been much more accommodative than I think many people anticipated. And I'm really excited about how that's going to change the landscape for us moving forward. You've been very patient. It was great to have some interaction, so thank you for your questions. I um, really appreciate your time. And please join me in saying thank you to Clement, to Kenan, and to Stephen. Thank you. Thank you.